Um, it was actually in 2006 when I was, uh, during my term as executive director of the Rex Foundation, and for those of you who, are, who don't know about it, that was the foundation started by the Grateful Dead in 1983 as their charitable arm, uh, to, and has given out now about $9 million, over 1,000 programs all over the country and internationally. And in my work to help create some new community and, and uh, bring new awareness to all the programs that we were granting and some of the issues we were dealing with. I did a newsletter uh, because I was asked how we incorporated human rights thinking in our work. And I wanted to go beyond the simple answer that it was in the genetic coding of the Grateful Dead culture. And as a result, wrote a newsletter, and I, I have to bring it up here because Alan Trist, my, the editor of that, is sitting here. I want him to see that it's still alive and well. Uh -huh. <laughs> and, um, and that newsletter is called Perspectives on Being Human. And it shed light on what the human rights framework is as this kind of binding frame of framework in which we could look at how all the endeavors, whether it's civil rights or women's rights or disability rights or the right to marry or any effort to right wrongs and make the world more accessible and equitable for everybody, could be seen as coming under human rights. And in that, we included the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And that document, if those of you who don't know, that was what was shepherded uh, under the leadership of Eleanor Roosevelt in 1945 when the United Nations was first set up as having the uh, force to be what all the member countries were there to do for, their, for the people in their countries with the idea that there would never again be a world war or holocaust or horrible behaviors of one person to the other. And on December 10th, 1948, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was uh, proclaimed by the General Assembly of the United Nations and spells out 30 universal rights. So we wanted to bring that to light in a more creative way and engaged uh, with, uh, wanted to have youth be part of that and as a result created a collaboration that involved Sarah Kroll from Destiny Arts who was our director of Youth Speaks and the, Sanford, the Mind Truth Youth Theater Project. And that began, we had an original production that was put on at Balboa High School on December 8, 2006, and it was called The World As It Could Be, A Declaration of Human Rights. The name came from one of our participating leaders who said, I never knew about this declaration, and it essentially spells out the world as it could be. And so what came from that was the realization that, first of all, we learned very few people. We've under, further understood only 7% of the US population knows of this document. Yet it was clear from the reactions of the young people learning about it and the adults as well that this was an important document that gave a framework, it was an international agreement that said this is what our world must be like. And there was a compelling engagement around it. And what gave that engagement and understanding was the use of the arts. It was through the techniques of the, the gifted leaders of Sarah and those from Youth Speaks and the Mind Troop where young people were given the opportunity to deepen their understanding through use of artistic activities and then the ability to express their ideas, that this is where they really gained an appreciation and embodiment of what the Universal Declaration was about. And so we set about, with the help of Balboa High School and Arroyo High School uh, in San Lorenzo, to create pilot curriculum that would use the arts, because we felt the arts were not being properly supported in the schools as being seen as a vital part of education, to use the arts as part of teaching the Universal Declaration of Human Rights as called for by the 
social studies standards in California as well as in other states, but particularly here, so that it was given its due uh, attention. And we also wanted to incorporate a culminating presentation as a form of a rite of passage, realizing the importance of young people having the opportunity to be the teachers and the inspirers about what those words mean. And so in 2010, we published our curriculum, and that was our, we then had our very first institute here at the University of San Francisco, at, at USF. And this is our fifth three-day institute that we've done where we teach our curriculum that uses the arts and a culminating presentation to deepen learning about the Universal Declaration. It is exciting. This is our first year where we've offered through San University of San Francisco two continuing education units with full partnership with the university in presenting this. We are really excited about it. And um, I think what you've seen, what we realize is how important it is for our we hope what you'll hear from our participants, um, the opportunity to learn about this topic and then have the arts be a vital ingredient to both learning and expressing. Um, so that's what you have seen as a result. And what I'd like to do is throw this open. Um, I, I also, actually, I just would like to recognize our uh, wonderful team of presenters. I'd like to recognize Dr. Susan Katz, who's the chair of the International Multicultural and who is really instrumental in, in creating this wonderful collaboration that went back as far as, I think, 2007. And then Sarah Kroll, our director. Sarah Kroll. <laughs> our general professor here at USF. And Alicia Wortley, who is up in the booth. the opportunity to perhaps ask some questions of our participants and just have a chance to have a little interchange about what this experience has meant. Anybody from the audience have a question? Yes? Nerds, congratulations. That was awesome. Yeah. <laughs> and I use nerds with all due respect. Um, I want to push it a little bit. I'm a student here as well in Miami. I love it. And you all got to be good people. Just kind of your vibe, the beautiful stuff you represented up there, um, and also to be here on a summer. So my question to you is um, to reflect on the program, UniHR, as well as what you do that brought you here. But why do you do what you do? Why do you do what you do? Who wants to answer that? Why do you do what you do? I have the microphone. Actually, I was asked that question just a couple, two or three days, right before I came to this seminar. And the reason I do what I do is truly I feel like I've been divinely called to, to work for peace, which is interconnected with what the human rights is all about. So yeah, it's an it's undeniable calling, you know, so yeah. And then to connect with youth, which this is all meant to connect with, mm -hmm vital for for anything we want to do in our world and community. Um, my mission is to create a world of freedom by teaching youth to break their chains. I'm born and raised in Oakland and that scenario was my situation in high school and um, what I realize on a daily daily basis is that young people are they want to be uplifted, they want to be held in high esteem and what our society does constantly is push them down and break them down. And as a high school, as a middle school vice principal, I see in my office more young men of color than anything else. And so my work through Ever Forward, which is my program, is to provide a space for young men to be able to talk about the emotional baggages they have to carry um, on a daily basis and in a safe place so that they can show those human emotions that they're not allowed to use in their communities. You know, I drove, drove, getting here on the bus, I came through the Tenderloin and the Fillmore. Mm -hmm. And I can't imagine, I mean, I grew up in Oakland, so I grew up in a rough area, but walking through that every day, trying to keep your mind focused on a prize mm -hmm. is difficult. Yeah. It, it's, it's, um, and I only did it two days, three days, mm -hmm. right? So imagine every day our young people, 10, 11, 12 years old, walking to school mm -hmm. through chaos, through war zones. And that's our war zone. And so that's why I do what I do. Mm -hmm. So 
I was in the Census Institute since the first one in 2010. Um, I'm a teacher at Fremont High School in East Oakland, and uh, I, uh, I brought it to Fremont High. And uh, we've been doing a production of The World is a Pit ever since. Um, I think teaching is an act of activism. I believe it is. Um, I believe that teaching as well as a, is, is, um, is not just a service, but it's, it's a reminder of, of, of life and death. And um, oftentimes, especially in East Oakland, the brother Shanti Branch could, could definitely chime in on that. Um, there's so much human rights violations that our kids don't even realize. Mm -hmm. And it, has, it affects the very condition that they live in. And it continues to, to propagate itself every day. And so when I came to this institute, um, I was blown away at how effective you can incorporate arts Something as trivial as, as, as seemingly trivial as like doing like a, an act on, you know, classic, gets kids in a way that, that's like, wow, I've never thought I could teach that way. And the kids are so engaged that they're like, you know what? I'm ready to move, I'm ready to sing, I'm ready to act. Let's talk about it, let's make something happen, let's, let's, let's teach me more. And so I use it as a vehicle, the arts, as a vehicle to, to, to interweave and interlace um, 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 notions on human rights violations both in the global scale, but most importantly, in the community scale. Mm -hmm. And so I feel like when the kids understand that, and they, they understand, they, they, for the first time, many of them are like, wow, you're actually teaching me something that's relevant to my life? Right. That's that cultural relevancy, that's that critical pedagogy that we've been pushing, that I've been personally trying to push, and this UDHR, um, HRE, Human Rights Education, has definitely been the, the spark that I needed in my own professional, as well as my personal development, um, in making me a more effective teacher to try to reach out to these kids in a way that they've never been reached out before, in a way that I've never taught before. Mm -hmm. So that's why I do what I do here, and that's why I'm back. Four out of five. <laughs> yeah, that's right, that's right. I couldn't make it last time because I was getting there. <laughs> 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 like weeks maybe, and she said it's just a matter of days, so I really want to thank you. I think one of the toughest problems we face at the school board is about disconnected youth, yeah. and I feel like I have just seen the silver bullet mm -hmm. of how to engage youth, and I'm interested in knowing what ideas people have and how to bring this back to their school sites yeah. and contacts. I'll, I'll address a, a gentleman's question as well. Um, I think the question was why, why, why are, why are we here? Correct? Mm -hmm. The question? And why do you do what you do? Why do we do? Um, well, first of all, just as, as an educator, I, I think it's just it's such a privilege, such an honor to be able to work with, with, with youth and, and with kids and to be part of that, that, del that, that process of developing, um, as a person and to be a part of that process is very special. Um, a mother, a loving mother, uh, when she uh, has a child and she holds her child close to her to keep her child warm and safe and protected. And as that child gets older, mom tries to put the best examples and try to teach that child to the best of her ability, uh, making sacrifices and giving everything she has to that child. Um, that's what you're supposed to do. Um, and, you know, uh, I ask myself as educators, I mean, are, are we giving the best of ourselves to our children, our students? So the reason why I'm here is I'm here to become a better person, the best person that I could possibly be. That way I could pass that on to my students. That's why I'm here. Did you want to answer the second part of how you see doing this? Oh, how I see doing this, it's, it's great to come together with other people who really believe in making real change. Um, and to do that, you have to put in time, you have to put in sacrifice. And you, you have to show up. <laughs> so um, it's, it's important. So I think it's important, too, to go through the training. Like any educator that was going to try to do this with young people, I think that you have to have been trained and experienced it with the wonderful facilitators that we've had. I mean, I'm the, I'm the singer that was offered 25 cents by a homeless man at a bus stop to stop singing. And I, I would not feel comfortable using my voice if I didn't have, you know, if I didn't have a facilitator um, who made us feel comfortable and have fun and believe in ourselves. And just, it, was, it just felt like play a lot of the time. 
Um, and I think that different one of us on stage, we might feel like we're artists and maybe in more than one way, some of us just in one way, but we had all, we had visual arts, we had a lot of movement art, we had voice art, um, and it just, we got to really play with it and feel comfortable with it and have fun with it. And I think now we believe and we know that even the shyest students, the most, um, I'm too fly to play can do it, um, but, but, but it's a process too, like it, we're all grown ups and we're all, I think, educators, so we're kind of naturally um, feel like building community, but they were very intentional in just the simplest icebreakers every day throughout the day to get us to a place where we could just really let loose and play together and deal with some really heavy subjects in a bit through the arts. Mm -hmm. I just like to put out there that when you're asking what we can do to bring this back, I also want to say for, for you as what I'm hearing as San Francisco um, Board of Education president, um, how do how do coming from the board and coming from the city and coming from school districts, how do you give time, resources, uh, money to be supporting teachers and the work that we want to do? Because it's it, it, it could be just like, oh, what are we going to do with it? But given the resources, we could do so much more if we, as teachers, were able to, if this kind of um, opportunity was more widespread, if, if teaching artists and facilitators were paid to come and work with school teachers mm. on a regular basis, yes. if the intention yes. of the school district and, and, and the city was that this kind of education is, is vital and imperative, and there was just a talk today about civic education and the, and the report put out by Mills and, um, and the, the Sacramento superintendent about the importance of civic education, civic engagement. So it's really about setting up those priorities at that level and making sure there's resources. And then, like you can see that, given that, there's so much more we can do. So, so it's really, it's, it's a nice opportunity that you're here. I appreciate folks who've come who have the access to those resources and can support teachers in all the varied ways that we can take this to our classrooms and communities. Mm -hmm. uh, hi. Uh, so I actually work with the San Francisco School District and um, I'm lucky enough to be a music teacher. So um, I get to do performances with my students um, all the time. I teach at the high school and then also a couple of different elementary schools. Um, and I mostly, I guess to answer both questions too, mostly came because uh, first year teaching and um, I, I started teaching at a school that was really challenging for me, um, but uh, felt myself inspired by the students. Um, and so thinking of bringing this to the students and thinking of that school specifically, it's an elementary school, Bryant Elementary School in Mission. Um, and I work with second, fourth, and fifth graders. Um, and specifically, I could see this being really effective. The curriculum is designed for high schoolers, but bringing elements of this um, UDHR to the fifth graders, um, because I, I, I have seen the depth of their understanding and I've seen them, um, they have some amazing, amazing classroom teachers over there as well. So I've seen them grapple with these really tough concepts. Um, and in a performance I did with them last year, uh, saw them, I mean performance, it's like you see them rise to the occasion, you know? Every time, I was just talking about this with a friend, every time you have a performance you're like, oh, is it gonna happen? And then <laughs> it like comes through and it, it happens and it's it's always this kind of like, you know, rite of passage thing. So, um, uh, where was I going with that? Um, yeah, so bringing this to the classrooms, um, I could definitely see bringing elements of the UDHR um, into my other curriculum with teaching musical elements, I'd probably do more of a musical performance rather than um, drama, but I know there's teachers I could collaborate with as well um, to kind of create something along this line in the school. So yeah, I could definitely see it being powerful with those students. Anyone else? <coughs> As, as a uh, special educator and also a parent of a special needs daughter, it, during this time, it was amazing for me because I could really understand more of what it's like to be uh, in her position, my student's position, because uh, my learning modality is not 
performance and you know all these art, you know theater and things like that. That's the opposite of what I'm good at. I'm not sure what I'm good at, but it's <laughs> but my group and people like Sarah and the whole staff, I mean, really supported me. And that's what we really need in the schools and everywhere else in life is that kind of support and encouragement and opportunity. And the UDHR, you know, the you know, the Declaration is something that. 1948, and it seems like it's not relevant to our times, or most of our students wouldn't understand, but it really is. And it's something that can really end a lot of the division because there's so much political and every other kind of division in our world. And our students need to be uh, exposed to the right kind of education about these things. A question? My name is Michael Alexander, and I'm a clinical case manager at uh, Reach Ashland uh, Youth Center. Yay! Yay. Yay. SLZ! <laughs> and um, the question that I actually had for you guys was, going through this training, what was the most challenging and the most uh, rewarding thing going through this process? So this is my fourth institute, and I, you know, keep coming back for a lot of the reasons that my colleagues have already shared. And people would, you would think that being my fourth time, it wouldn't, there wouldn't be very many challenges. But there's always challenges of meeting a new community. Um, performance comes with its own set of challenges, and I always joke with Judith that I dread singing, and yet <laughs> I'm singing right next to her on stage each and every time. And so I think that. Um, it is challenging. We get out of our comfort zone. And I think that's important for educators to be pushed out of our comfort zones constantly. Um, because as so many of my colleagues have said, our youth, they have to deal with discomfort on a daily basis. And so for us to understand that and be their advocates, it's important that we challenge ourselves. And I think Mario also spoke about becoming a better person. I mean, and John too, about how this is, for me, this is professional and personal development. I can't imagine starting my school year um, any other way. But it's not easy, it's challenging. And I, this is the second year in a row where I've missed significant parts of the preparation. And I come in and I hit the ground running and my colleagues tell me, here's what you're gonna do. It's like, okay, I can do that. So um, it doesn't make it any less scary though, but um, just throwing the willingness to throw yourself in there. But it is challenging. And I could see why, um, you know, for some educators who've been through this training, and they don't come back or they don't implement, it, it's because it's challenging. And as David talked about, we may not always feel that, you know, I'm not a performance teacher, I'm not an artistic teacher, how do I pull this off, you know, in my classroom? And I think it's important to be here, to be present for the training, to be willing, to be open, and to have the support of our leaders um, is really important. Okay. Do we have time for one more comment? Yeah. So for me, the challenges and rewards kind of go hand in hand. Um, and day one seemed to be the day where those challenges and rewards kind of fell into my lap where uh, when we're starting to do more of the content, so to speak, we're learning about the history of the document um, and we're all starting to share, whether we share or not, our personal stories, um, I at times get to start to recognize my privilege that I'm sometimes blind to. So there's a challenge to be in that and then the awareness of that is such a, is such a like, whoa, that's a reward to now have myself kind of shed the light on that. Um, and it was also an opportunity for me to share a story um, where a lot of times in this world I have an invisible privilege that is not necessarily always seen. Um, so that's always a, a gift for myself to feel permission with a group of colleagues who are holding me in that way even though we just barely knew each other. But because of the movement and the singing and the art, it's, it brings us all closer together. Um, so for me, the challenge and reward is, is that hand in hand piece. So in honoring all of our times, I think we're going to have to draw this piece to a close. I welcome people. We are, we will be having lunch down the hall, and mm. all of you are welcome to join us and mingle for a little bit longer before we begin our, our, our final chapter of this. But I, I want to thank everybody for what you've done today. I think this is demonstrating, you know, what we hope is the types of presentations that you saw in, in the classroom setting as we've seen. I've been to the presentations done at Arroyo, at Fremont, and at Balboa High Schools all these last several years that happened every December. And what I've seen and what I've had the pleasure of experiencing as I talk to the students involved is that they are gaining not those that are presenting have the have the thrill of 
being the teachers there and seeing how they can connect with their communities of students and teachers to learn just a little bit more about how these human rights ideas connect very seriously with their day in and day out lives and that they have an opportunity to think a little bit differently about the issues and find ways to really address what sometimes seem almost insurmountable or overwhelming and yet they can find that there are positive ways to make a difference in, in their immediate circles. And that's what Eleanor Roosevelt said, the words in this document mean nothing unless they mean something to us in our very immediate world. And that's what we hope is coming of all this work and that it keeps rippling. So thank you for being part of this and I hope you'll continue our conversation down the hall. Thank you very, very much. And for you who have always been so supportive each year saying, what is it you need again? <laughs> and, and being there to help make our continuing documentation of this work and the sharing of particularly these culminating presentations available to everybody. So thank you too. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So